So our third type of chromato chromatography is called gas chromatography or GC and it's very, very sensitive. So it's um, used in forensics more, in, in drug analysis because you don't need an awful lot. It's very good for things with low boiling points, so volatile things, which a lot of organic chemicals that are in drugs, um, so forensic analysis needs. So we call those volatile ones with the low boiling points. So it's very good at separating volatile compounds. So let's have a look at our picture again so we can figure out about our stationary phase and our moving phase. So what happens here is we have an oven, high temperature and high pressure. We inject our sample in at the top here. This is where we're going to inject it. And it's going to pass through this very tightly wound column. Now we have that column round, round, wound round like that to increase the distance, the length that the things need to travel. We're then going to force everything through using a gas, which is why it's called gas chromatography. And that gas needs to be an inert gas, an unreactive gas, so it doesn't react with our components. It allows the components to dissolve into it, they go with it, or they can be retained inside the column for longer. And we're going to time how long it takes them to come out at the end with some sort of detector that's going to pick them up. Okay, now we've got two boxes for stationary phase here because that column could be filled with two types of thing. So we just need to bear that in mind. We could have a thin layer of liquid on a solid support because it's hard to put liquids in there. So we need some sort of solid support, maybe some beads and our liquid coats those beads inside that column. So it's a thin layer of liquid inside the column. Now the, the support is not the stationary phase. That's like the glass in TLC. It's just there to hold the stationary phase in place. So the stationary phase is the liquid here. Or you could have it where um, the column is packed with some solid. And those, again, it might be um, powder. Things have got to be able to get through, so it might be beads. So we could have a solid stationary phase or a liquid phase, stationary phase. And if you go back to the introduction video, there was different, slight differences in the separation depending on liquid or solid stationary phase. Our mobile phase is our inert, unreactive carrier gas. So a gas that's going to carry everything. So we, it's a gas that is our mobile phase. And so they're going to be things like um, neon, nitrogen, helium, okay, these kind of things. Okay. And this time, whereas in TLC our mobile phase moved up, and in column chromatography our mobile phase moved down, this is going to move through the column, because the column is not vertical, it's wrapped around, so it's just going to be pushed through the column, and it's going to be done at a high temperature and a high pressure. The gas, it needs to be pressurised. So here we go. Again, it's not the required practical, so a bare minimum of detail needed here. We inject the sample into the gas chromatography machine where it's going to vaporise because it's in an oven and they're very volatile. The carrier gas, the inert gas, the moving phase, pushes it through the column and components slow down as they are retained by the stationary phase. Each column leaves at a different time and we call that its retention time. is detected so we can measure these retention times. So what's that going to look like for us to analyse? So remember we're measuring something called retention time this time not retardation factor. This is a time taken to pass from the column inlet to the detector. Now, I was always remembered when I was at school it's the time taken from injection to detection because it kind of rang in my head. Um, so we inject it at the column inlet and we detect it. It's the time taken between the time you inject it, you press a button when you inject it, and then the time that that component comes out. The longer that time is, 
the greater the component's retention to the stationary phase, it's more retained. And the less soluble it was in the gas moving phase. The shorter that retention time, the more soluble the component was in the gas moving phase, it went with the moving phase, and the less it is retained by that stationary phase. Whether the stationary phase is solid or liquid, it is retained in some way. And different components will have different retention values, so we could use them for identification. So just have a little think about how it would be different if it was a solid versus a liquid, so that we know that if it's a solid, remember that although this diagram is drawn upwards, ours would be moving through a spiral column, so it would be spiralling round. If it's a solid support, the moving phase, our gas, in this case it's our gas, is flowing through our column and it's pushing the samples with it. So up here we've got the most soluble in the moving phase and down at the bottom we've got the most, the greatest retention to the stationary phase. Now because this is a solid the retention is going to be by adsorption, that's sticking to the side of the solid. Now if we swap to our other type of column where it's a liquid, our mobile phase is still a gas and this is still the one that's the most soluble in the moving phase. This is the one that's moved the most. And this up at the bottom is still the one with the greatest retention. It's just that now because our stationary phase is a liquid, it's being retained by dissolving into the liquid. So it's just a slightly different method of retention, but don't worry because AQA just want you to be able to describe it as greatest retention for the most retained and most soluble for the one that moves the most. So you can just say retention and you will be fine. So it remember, it depends on this balance between the solubility and the retention. So what does our gas chromatograph look like? Okay, it's going to look something like this here. And we can see all these peaks and they're coming out at different times. And we're going to have a number of peaks. Now the number of peaks is going to give you a, uh, not including this solvent peak, that's just your um, solvent that you've injected with it. The number of peaks is giving you the minimum number of components. And that is because big peaks like this one here could be hiding smaller peaks. There could be another peak underneath that that you can't really see. So it's the minimum number of components. So you just need to be careful. A large peak could hide a smaller one. The area under each peak is proportional to the amount. So the bigger the peak, the greater the concentration. Okay, so let's have a go at a question. Our first thing we've got to do is mark on where's of no retention time, time equals zero. Well, time equals zero is when the solvent came out because uh, you wouldn't have any sample at that point. You've injected your solvent to start with, so time equals zero is the time when the solvent came out. And then we've got our other peaks. Which one is retained the most? Has the greatest retention by the stationary phase? So greatest retention means um, least soluble in the moving phase, which means it takes the longest. So we're looking for the one with the longest retention time. Most retention, longest RT. So we go along and we look carefully. It's this one here, linolenic acid. Which one is present in the greatest amount? Remember that that's the biggest peak. Unfortunately, have very similar names, linoleic acid. What's the minimum number of fatty acids? So you have to count the peaks. Now, we've got definitely one, two, three, four. You could argue that there's another one there, but we're not really sure. So at minimum, we've definitely got four. Why might there be more? Well, large peaks can hide smaller ones. 
In um, TLC, we've got some limitations. Many compounds will have the same retention time because they're similar compounds, they're probably isomers. Peaks of high concentration hide those smaller peaks, and unknowns have no reference value.